very good morning to all of you and welcome to our first service. I've taken a month break and it's good to be back. It's been a good break uh, with long walks in the parks and just restful times of uh, reading the Lord's Word, God's Word and um, in reflecting, meditating on it. I want to not forget to commend all of you. This is a super long weekend and yet you took time to come here early and to prepare your hearts to worship Him. Can I just uh, invite you to stand as I read our call to worship this morning. I've chosen Psalms 147 and the psalmist calls the people of God together. Psalms 147, reading from the NIV UK version. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise Him. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. His pleasure is not in the strength of horses, nor His delight in the legs of the warriors. But the Lord delights in those who fear Him, who put their hope in His unfailing love. Let's pray. Father, as we gather together as a family, brothers and sisters, coming together to worship You in spirit and in truth, we remember that, Lord, You do not delight in the strength of the horse. You do not delight in the legs of the warriors, but You delight in those who fear You who continue to put their hope in your steadfast, unfailing love. And this morning, Lord, we are reminded of your great love for us. We thank you, we praise you, in Jesus' name. Amen.
to the brother or sister beside you. Just sing this bridge as a blessing over each and every one of them as a body of Christ. And if you don't know the people in front of you, it's fine. Maybe it's a name that the Lord placed on your heart. But just sing this together. May His presence be full in a thousand generations in your family and their children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you. children and the children his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a 
Psalms 18 verse 2 to 3, the Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I have been saved from my enemies. You know, all throughout scripture, we see men calling upon the Lord for strength in their time of need. And what does God do? He comes through for each and every one of them. He was with Moses when they crossed the sea. He was with David when he went up against Goliath. And he was with King Jehoshaphat and his troops when they were outnumbered and being invaded. They might have feared the situation before them, but the Lord God provided them with both strength and protection. And even now, that is His promise to us, and it remains true. That even though we fear the unknown or the future, or even the impossible, we know for certain that He will be our fortress and our deliverer.
Good morning, church. Please be seated. Just uh, two weeks ago, we remembered Good Friday and celebrated Easter Sunday. It was wonderful to see uh, nearly all the seats here were filled. And more importantly, it was uh, wonderful to see a number of you, brothers and sisters in Christ, who rededicated your lives again to Jesus. And a few who even, I uh, believe, answered the call by Pastor Jonathan to receive the salvation prayer. I hope you are with us this morning to partake in the Holy Communion. And I just pray that you will continue to grow spiritually uh, with the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, although the Holy Communion reenacts uh, the events that took place, uh, the Lord's uh, Last Supper with His disciples before He was arrested and uh, crucified the following day, it is really about uh, remembering Good Friday and Easter Sunday throughout the rest of the year. And I'll, exp share, I'll explain a bit of this in a short while, right? So, let me first read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, beginning with verse 23. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread, and drink this cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, we are to regularly come together as a body of Christ, as a body of believers, to take the Holy Communion, to remember Jesus for who he is and what he has done for us. He is our Lord and Savior. He loves us so much that he sacrificed his life for our sins so that we can be reconciled with God and that sin will no longer have dominion over us. To also remember his resurrection, his power and victory over death so that we have the hope and confidence and no longer fear death. And lastly, also to remember that he will return to judge and to restore this fallen world. Apostle Paul also told us that only those who believe in Jesus Christ as, his, as their Lord and Savior are to partake in the Holy Communion. And um, also, we ought to examine our hearts before we take of the Holy Communion, of the bread and cup. So now I would invite all of us just to take a moment. Will you just close your eyes? I will invite you to just respond to what I've just shared with you about the Holy Communion, what it is all about. And also to ask God for His forgiveness and help in areas that you have not been right with Him. Would you do that now?
Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love. And thank you for hearing our prayers and forgive your forgiveness of our sins. Lord, this morning we just want to come before you and just lay our burdens upon you. And as we remember what you did for us on Good Friday and how you have risen on Easter Sunday, Father, we just want to give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, now take the bread and the cup together. Body of Christ which is broken for you. And the cup which represents his blood. The new covenant. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that our salvation is by your grace alone and not by our works. We thank you for your love, for sending your Son Jesus to redeem us and for giving us the Holy Spirit to help us face our daily challenges and the temptations of this world. Please help us to be humble to submit to you and to love one another so that we may live fulfilling lives that will glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's rise.
now go into a time uh, of prayer, but before that, uh, those of you who want to drop your offering can tie in the boxes in the front and at the back. You can do that after the service. Those of you who want to give your tie through electronic means, there's a QR code that you can take out and uh, yeah, scan it. This morning, uh, for our time of prayer together, we want to remember the Ng family. We have lost a very dear brother, Joseph, and we just want to pray for Christina and her three girls, young girls. We also just want to remember those who are taking trips abroad um, for this weekend, just that the Lord will give them protection and they have good family bonding times together. And we just want to remember also May Day and Hari Raya. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you're a God who is almighty and Lord, yet Lord, mysterious God and your purposes are far, far way beyond our understanding. Lord, we remember Brother Joseph that Lord, you would take him into your eternal presence at such a young age. But yet Lord, we know that all things will work together for good for those who love you. We just want to pray now for Christina and her three daughters. That Lord, as they continue to remember and grieve over the loss of her husband and father to the three girls, and as a church, we come alongside her to comfort her, journey with her, encourage and support her. But Lord, your comfort is beyond us. Your presence can continue to hold and sustain Christina and the girls. So Father, we pray that um, the cell group, Pastor Jonathan and the rest, uh, Nancy, as they come alongside the family, Lord, would you encourage them, strengthen them. Father, we want to remember families who are on road trips or on overseas. We pray that they will have good family bonding times together. Lord, would you just cover them and protect them in their travels. Lord, we want to also remember that today we remember all of those who have work. That Lord, this work you have given us is a blessing from you. And through this work, we can be a testimony and witness of your goodness and faithfulness to us. In the places of work you have placed us, wherever that may be, in our interaction with our colleagues, our, our supervisors, and those who work uh, uh, that we, we manage, and those who work under us as well, we will show your grace, your mercy, and your love. We want to remember those without work and waiting. Father, we pray that, Lord, in the midst of waiting, you will continue to draw them close to you and trust you that in your good time, you open up the right doors them to find work that is meaningful, purposeful, and good fit for their training and their, their personality. Lord, we want to also just remember our Muslim brothers and Muslim friends who celebrate Hari Raya this weekend. We remember that, Lord, you love and die for them as well. And Lord, in the midst of those that we work with, our neighbours, our friends, Father, if there are opportunity for us to just continue to be testimony and witness for you, Lord, we ask for that opening, that word of encouragement, that word of comfort that we may be able to bring to these Muslim friends and neighbours. Lord, we want to pray as we go into this time of studying your word we pray for pastor ma as he brings us your word in psalms and uh, proverbs lord may you prepare our hearts to hear your still small voice so lord we thank you prepare our hearts to obey you we give you thanks and praise in jesus name amen Thank you, Pastor Alvin. Well, 
this week and the next is the shortest sermon series we are going to get into. It's a sermon series, so we will have at least one sermon, and uh, it is the shortest, so it is only two. <laughs> well, so our series actually will be on the book of Proverbs. Can we have the slides? Yeah. And uh, we shall start today with an overview of the book and then cover the first seven verses in Proverbs 1, 1 to 7. And next Sunday, we shall conclude with the last chapter, which is in Proverbs chapter 31, on the godly woman, which is also a fitting celebration on Mother's Day. Now, just a very brief overview on the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, actually, together with the book of Job, the book of Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon, belong to a book, uh, uh, classifications of five books in the Bible that is called the wisdom literature. And why, you may be wondering, you know, why, why they are called wisdom literature? You know, these, these are just some possible relation to it. You see, probably one of the reasons could be that Solomon, who is also one of the greatest in, uh, person involved in this uh, whole enterprise of writing these five books, is actually an author, direct author of three of these books here, in, of these five books. And Solomon is known as one of the wisest men of all. Okay? But one thing about the uh, characteristics about the wisdom literature is this, as you and I read these books is that wisdom literature and wisdom books, they are less at revealing the facts and the knowledge concerning God and life. As when you encounter that in the Torah, in the law, or in the prophets, or even in the Gospels in the New Testament. But wisdom literature really are more into applying God's facts and knowledge into our life. And that's what makes them a bit different because they are really our personal responses to God rather than God's direct revelation to us many times. So therefore, they are usually more insight and wisdom rather than knowledge and information. Talking about insight and knowledge, well, an investment company actually advertised this on the Wall Street Journal Okay, and on the first full front page, it mentioned this. Information is everywhere. Insight is all too rare. For insight goes beyond information to discern underlying truth. Isn't that what we are facing today in our 21st century? Indeed, today we tend to be long on information, but short on insight. What used to be voluminous encyclopedias lining the shelves, what used to be textbooks occupying libraries after libraries, today is just a click away from our laptop or even the swipe from our smartphone, isn't it? We are indeed wired, but often we are tired. Tired from trying to grasp all we can know. We are knowledgeable. We are information rich. But yet, we can be not wise inside reach. As evidenced many times by our struggle in discerning what is fake from what is true, what is right from what is wrong. You see, the Bible tells us the true wisdom, the ability to determine all of this really comes from the word of the Lord. Proverbs itself, chapter 2, verse 6 says, for the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, all comes really from the Lord. And our, our passage today, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 to 7, have these to say. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and for instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instructions in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, 
knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. And let the discerning get guidance for understanding and proverbs and parables, the sayings and the riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1, 1 to 7. True to his wisdom, this book actually opens with a very easy outline. I like to call it the three W's. Verse 1 talks about the what of wisdom. And then verse 2 to verse 6 tell us the whys of the wisdom. And finally, the crescendo of it, the theme and the motto, in fact, of the entire book, chapter 1, verse 7, talk about the wisdom of the Proverbs. And so this is what the outline we are going to follow today. Now, first, what? What is wisdom? Sorry. What is wisdom? What, what is Proverbs? Sorry. Well, uh, the, 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 the Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1, opens with this, the Proverbs of Solomon. And we ask ourselves this question, what are Proverbs? Well, here's a very good definition that I encounter. Okay. Miguel de Cervantes, okay, the author of Don Quixote, basically says, a proverb is a short sentence based on long experience. Isn't it wonderful? That very, very short maxim, axiom that you have does not come to you easy. It comes with somebody's long, long, long experience. And that's what proverbs are. What about the original word proverbs? Well, in Hebrew, the word proverbs is actually from the word mashal. Okay? And mashal basically has this idea to mean that to represent or to be like. In fact, it's something like a simile. Okay? To compare with also a comparison. Now, we can see this whole work of proverbs of mashal to be like, to compare with as we read the proverbs. For example, you just take a look at uh, Proverbs 16.24. When it says to be like, there are many such verses, such proverbs. You see, pleasant words are like honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. It is also often used, uh, the, the aspect of comparison to help us understand what it means. Okay? And as Proverbs 15, 17 says, better is a dinner of vegetables where love is than a fatted ox and hatred with it. You see immediately there's a comparison. What is better than another thing? Okay? A dinner of vegetables compared to a fatted ox, okay? where love is and where hatred is. There's that comparison, that opposite that we can see that they have. In fact, those are short, param- those are short proverbs. They are also long proverbs. Okay? Long proverbs is a discourse of a few pages okay? or a short story. In fact, we have a name for them. We call them parables. The parables are also a form of proverbs. And in the New Testament, we know that Jesus is a master user of parables. So if I can say this, if Solomon is considered the progenitor of proverbs in the Bible, then our Lord Jesus Christ will be considered the perfecter of proverbs in the highest level. So now that we have introduced what a proverb is, I think it's good to just go into a bit of the outline, <laughs> okay? I hope you enjoy this uh, picture here uh, of the color coding and you can see uh, the progress of uh, proverbs altogether. You see, the book of Proverbs, firstly, is a collection. It's not one proverb, it's a collection of many proverbs, chiefly by Solomon and written also by Solomon. And then, a few hundred years ago, Hezekiah added more collection of Solomon into it. And it also includes some other people's proverbs whom we are not sure who they are. Okay, Agar and Lemuel. And some people thought that Lemuel could be another name for Solomon or it could just be another person. We'll just leave it at that. Now, it's also possibly that proverbs is also a collection. It's not only just proverbs from Israel. There are also problems that are taken from other parts of the world, from Egypt, okay, from probably from Arabia. 
thousand years even before Solomon's time. So it's not just original Proverbs. They are also popular Proverbs in those days. Now, I'd like to help you remember. What is the outline of Proverbs? Okay. Well, I would, I would like to call it seven verses followed by seven collections. Okay. Now, the first seven verses are important. They are in the prologue. Okay. And basically, you can see that these are the seven verses that is key that actually tell us uh, the title, the target, and the theme okay, of this whole book altogether. And after that, we see it follows, we have seven collections, okay? And the first few collections from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 9 are basically Proverbs by Solomon, okay? Leaving the last two as possibly by some other people. We can also call these, therefore, Proverbs are really heavenly wisdom that are for worldly problems. They are God's point of view to help us understand how to live it out on earth. Okay. Now, the question now we want to ask is, in the first part, is, is uh, you know, the Proverbs of Solomon. So we immediately come to the second part of the what. Who wrote Proverbs? Okay. The, 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 the Proverbs of Solomon, okay. the son of David. Right in the beginning, Solomon is listed as the, as the overall author and contributor of this, uh, of this book altogether. In fact, Two other times in this book, it's mentioned that Solomon da, is, is, a, is a main collector of all these Proverbs. Now, he is possibly the most qualified person to be this author because we know that he was wise. And the Bible tells us that he spoke with more than 3,000 Proverbs himself, of which, if you count all the short Proverbs, we have at least 375 in the book of Proverbs. Okay? And the Bible tells us that he composed more than 1,005 songs, okay, of which we know that at least one of those songs it could be the Song of Solomon, also found in the Bible. And this is what 1 Kings chapter 4 mentions. So it says, So God gave Solomon wisdom and every great insight, and a breath of understanding as measureless as the sand of the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else. And then he goes on in verse 32. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 8,005. And at the end of it, verse 34 says, from all nations people will come to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all kings of the world who had heard of the wisdom. Now, earlier on in chapter 3 of 1 Kings, he identifies the source of this wisdom. 1 Kings chapter 3 tells us that in a dream, God revealed himself to Solomon. And Solomon asked the Lord, you know, to help him to be wise and to have an understanding heart. And the Lord endowed on him wisdom, the Bible tells us. So we want to enter into our first application here. What can we learn just from this introduction? I think we want to first of all learn how we should be reading the book of Proverbs. If what if Proverbs is this, what, what is so special about Proverbs? Let me just tell you this, that 49% of this book, that is from chapter 10 to chapter 29, okay, or two-thirds of the chapters, if you go by chapters of this book, consists of what we call short proverbial maxims. Most of the uh, proverbial maxims in Hebrew Proverbs really comprise a couplet, okay? a, a first part and the second part of a sentence okay? that basically help us understand the full meaning of, of the proverb. Now, these maxims, firstly, let me just tell you, they are incidental and they are not contextual. Okay? What do I mean by that? In other words, each maxim stands on their own. They don't have any relation with the maxim in front or after it. So you cannot read a context. So unlike other parts of the Bible where we say you need to know the context, sometimes in Proverbs, you know, they stand on their own. So you no need to know the context. This is very special. Okay? Second thing, you need to understand that Proverbs are randomly arranged. Okay? They jump from one topic to another topic and the topic can go all over the place. Okay? From the household to the field to animals to the wife that goes in the attic and so forth. All kinds of things. Okay, 
Now, so here are some rules of engagement I'd like to share with you. Okay? What are they? First, you need to understand that short proverbial, proverbial maxims are therefore to be interpreted as disconnected maxims. So you don't try to relate them together. You don't try to say that today I'm going to speak on the, on the whole of Proverbs chapter 15 and they are all related together. No, Proverbs chapter 15 com comprise many maxims that are individual stand alone on their own. Second thing, you need to understand that because they are Proverbs, they are exaggerated. They are not meant to be technically okay, accurate and precise. Okay? Instead, at Proverbs, they are made purposely short, manageable, and memorable. Okay? Something that is outstanding for you. I'd like to give you an example. In English today, we also use a lot of Proverbs, right? Okay? One very simple one, for example, I'd like to give you it will be this. Okay? Leap. <laughs> Look before you leap. Simple proverb. Just four words, look before you leap. Many of us know what it means, okay? It means to say, watch you know, where you are going before you quickly move forward. Right? Look before you leap, don't anyhow run, okay? And it can also, of course, apply to your life when you're planning. You need to do some planning, okay? Don't anyhow quickly involve into something without even thinking ahead. Okay? However, let me just ask you, if I were to make the sentence, if I want to make it very precise, how would I make it? <laughs> Somebody may say this, okay? In advance of committing yourself to a course of action, consider your circumstances and your options. Friends, I think that's drafted by a lawyer <laughs> or a linguist who try to be very accurate, okay? Now, if you want to be accurate, you'll say the one in blue, okay? But what will happen is that people will forget what you're saying. They need to check your dictionary. <laughs> but if you tell somebody, look before you leave, even a child will understand and will know it. And so that's the power of Proverbs. But that's very different, okay? On the other hand, look before you leave. Okay? Although it's compelling and although it's forceful, okay, it could be misunderstood. For example, it does not tell you where to look for. <laughs> It does not tell you, you know, where you should be looking at, who you should be looking at before, or what you should be looking at before you jump. How long should you wait before you jump? In fact, the whole thing is not about jumping at all. <laughs> right? Well, so we need to understand that problems are such, and in, we need to interpret them as such, and we cannot therefore try to wrangle deep meanings, okay? When the word is trying to say that we are trying to give you a whole idea overview meaning of the whole thing. Well, the next thing about Proverbs is this, that they are not absolute maxims. Okay? This is not a short Proverbs. What is stated is usually hopefully true, but not always true. They are observations. Okay? They are not commands, per se. For example, Proverbs 10, 27 says this, The fear of the Lord adds life. To length, X length to life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. Again, I'll say this, hopefully this is true, but you and I know from life, this is not always true. So please don't go and grab this and say that this is a promise from God. God says, the fear of the Lord adds length to life. I'm going to fear the Lord and the Lord 100% will give me long life. And why is it that person is so good and he dies so early? Well, this is not what Proverbs is about. It's not promising you this, okay? It's just telling you that, you know, this is not the absolute maxim. And therefore, conversely, it is also not guarantees from God, okay? So please don't, you know, just wrangle God and say to God, you know, this is a guarantee from you, okay? Let me just tell you this. This is very important. What are Proverbs? They are Proverbs of possibilities and not Proverbs promises. Okay. God's proverbs are proverbs of possibilities, not proverbs of promises. If you hang on to it as promise, you are going to be disappointed. Some people, parents especially, hang on to this and think that this is a promise. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train children in the right way, and when they are old, they will not stray. Some, some parents, you know, if they claim this as promise, they may be disappointed. God, I brought my child to kingdom jewels when they were young. I brought them to frontline when they were youth. 
I sent them to the young adults when they were older, and now today they have strayed away from you. I've done all this. Why is it so? I trained my child. Why is it so? Friends, you need to understand. This is not a proverb of promise. This is a proverb of possibility. Okay? There is no guarantee that God is promising you this. Okay? Or if you just take another example, okay? a more hilarious one, huh? Proverbs 27 verse 14. If anyone loudly blesses their neighbour early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. <laughs> I, I don't know whether you have such a roommate or not. Wow, well, early morning, they're very spiritual. They wake up, hallelujah. And they wake you up. And they, ha, ha, it curses him like anything. I think it talks about you know, the humor that God has. Okay? But yet, at the same time, we cannot take this as a promise or anything. It just tells you the facts of what is possible. Okay? But then some of you may be saying, Pastor, then are you saying that I cannot treat people Proverbs like I treat other parts of the Bible if it's not a promise? Does it mean that the Bible, the Proverbs is a second-class canon? It's a second-class Bible? It's not inspired by God? No, that's not what I'm trying to say. The Proverbs is 100% the Word of God also. But it's such that you need to know the genre of the Proverbs. It's not meant to write to you there and tell you everything here is a promise. It's supposed to give you wisdom in life. And so this is a very important principle I want to leave with you this. And it is always read out of the Bible, but never read into the Bible. Never read your experience into the Bible and say, therefore the Bible means this to me. But read out of the Bible, let the Bible speak to you. Let the Bible speak to you. Don't speak yourself into the Bible. Eh? There are, however, let me just end by here by talk, telling you this. There are, however, some proverbs that are unconditionally true. What kind of proverbs? These will be proverbs that deals with God or an attribute or characteristics of God. And here are some examples. Okay? For example, it says, uh, Proverbs 11.1, 1, The law detests the dishonest scales, but accurate weights find favour with him. This is always true because it talks about the Lord's characteristics. And then Proverbs 12, 22, the Lord detests lying lips. This is also always true. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch over the wicked and the good. This is also always true. The Lord is always watching. All persons' ways seem to be pure to them, but the motives and way are weighed by the Lord. This is also always true. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is maker of them all. Always true. So there are some parts of the Bible or in Proverbs that we know is always true. We can cling on to that. Now, having done all that introduction, I think it's good for us now to go into the second part. We talk about the whys of Proverbs. And it's found in verse 2 to verse 6. And this is what it says. For the whys of the gospel. He said it is for gaining wisdom and instruction. It is for understanding words of insight. This is for receiving instruction in prudent behaviour. It is doing what is right and just and fair. For giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. And then verse 6 is for understanding Proverbs parables, the sayings and the riddles of the young. I can find here a five-fold of the purpose of the book of Proverbs. And each of the time here, we understand that there is a purpose because especially, you know, the, the version here, the NIV version, help us see it very clearly. It says, it's for, it's for, it's for, it's for. Okay. And actually, you find that verse 5 is actually a kind of a parenthesis. Okay. While verse 4 says that, you know, it is for helping the simple and the young, verse 5 kind of tells us, hey, and by the way, uh, it's not only the simple and the young, the wise will also benefit from it. Okay? So, what can we learn here from the whys of Proverbs? Okay? I think we want to ask this question. How does Proverbs help us? Okay? And the first thing I, I, I think I can pick up from here from verse 2 to 6 is this. It's that it helps us to learn. It helps us to learn. You see, here the word wisdom Remember, we see the word instruction, insight, prudence, knowledge, discretion, whole. Oh, you know, we really, there's so many of them. But let me just tell you, actually, these are all but synonymous expression of one same word. And the word is learning. 
learning. Okay? Now, I'm sure if I were to ask you to think hard enough, you'll probably remember an axiom or a proverb that, that was left behind for you, maybe by an elder, maybe by your parents, or maybe by a teacher, or maybe even by some well-known people that you come across, right? Axioms, proverbs help us remember. You know, while just writing this sermon, I look up at that point of time, and I look at my wife, and I ask her, Elaine, you know, can you tell me what one axiom or proverb you know, that had come to you down through life that you remember? And do you know something? Within two seconds, she answered me, yes, I can. And you know what she said? She told me, you know, it is the word called zi ai <laughs> in Chinese, which translated means self-love or loving yourself that my father left with me. Now, let me just tell you a little bit background story here. Firstly, in case you misunderstand, when Elaine's father told her zi ai or self-love and loving yourself, you may think, that is a very selfish, self-centered word. Right? Loving yourself, love, love other people. No. But really, he, what, what he meant was really the positive sense of it. In other words, he's not saying that you selfishly love yourself, you seek your own love. No. But basically, he was telling her, in everything you do, okay, please have this consideration that you, know, you must respect yourself, that you don't hurt yourself, that you never degrade yourself. Now, Elaine's dad gave her these two words on actually a very rare occasion. She told me that you know, it was a time that she happened to be alone with her dad. She was about sex for that time. And if you know his dad, his dad is a man of very few words. He's a very quiet man. The only word I remember of his dad, who is my father-in-law, is yao pu yao he cha. And I love the tea tea that he always made for me. I'll say, yes. <laughs> and that's the only benefit I got from him and I remember most. But for Elaine, these words, zi ai, self-love, stayed with her for the rest of her life. And, you know, the father, even though he was just like the quietest man on earth, okay, but a man of few words, it's inconceivable that any word could be quoted of him. But today, 10 years after his death, Elaine still remembers the axiom, zi ai, self-love, loving yourself. The power of Proverbs to help us learn. Talking about that, you know, even one who is deaf, and Lisa is here helping us to translate to those who are deaf, even to one who is deaf, they can leave behind words. Words of power to help us learn. You know, my elder sister and my brother-in-law are both deaf, but they have speaking children, children who can speak. My, my brother-in-law just passed away last Sunday on the 24th of uh, April. And my niece shared an eulogy at the cremation. And she shared that one of her most vivid memories was a pet talk that her father had done for her and her younger brother when they were in school going age. The father just sat them down, okay, and in one hour plus, give them a pep talk in sign language on what he hoped them to be as they grow up and what kind of principles they want, he wanted them to live by. Friends, and that was what my niece shared as an eulogy. The only thing that lasts for her that really remembered about her dad, even though he couldn't speak, was that pet talk that he would have given to them. She never forget that. So friends, you need not be a smart Solomon to leave behind Proverbs. Even if you are a quiet man, even if you have just two words or even one word, or even just call for a pet talk when you could not really speak, they can become Proverbs of transformation for another person. The next thing I, I learned here about Proverbs is this. How, do, how does Proverbs help us? It's that verse 3 tells us that it helps us change in our behaviour. You see, what does verse 3 say? Okay. Verse 3 says, For receiving instruction in prudent behaviour, doing 
what is right and just and fair. What kind of behavior? Doing what is right and what is just and what is fair. Okay? Now, it seems to be so simple, isn't it? It seems to be a no-brainer, isn't it? But because it is so taken for granted, many of us actually fail at doing this. We fail to do what is right. We fail to do what is just. We fail to do what is fair. And these are the three heart cry of the Old Testament. Indeed, we need to know, as what they used to say here, wrong is wrong, even if everyone is doing it. And right is right, even if no one is doing them. As someone to well put this into a question and say this, you know, what is one way to heaven? What is the way to heaven? The answer is, turn right, go straight. <laughs> turn right in your heart, go straight in your heart. That's what we are trying to say, okay? So today, if somebody come up to you later and ask you for direction, huh? remember, just tell them, turn right, go straight, and you will not be wrong. <laughs> well, it is especially also for the simple and for the young. Okay? You see, the wisdom literature generally denotes people's spiritual receptivity with three kinds of descriptions and labels. When you read, actually, the wisdom literature, you always come across these three groups of people that I'm going to introduce to you. First is what the people we call the wise. Who are the wise? The wise in this book, in the Bible here, always refers to those who are spiritually wise. Those who fear the Lord, as Proverbs 1, 7 tells us. Those who live, not just for today, but those who live, not just for this earth, but those who live for tomorrow, those who live for God, those who live for eternity. These are the wise. Then there's a second group of people that the Bible talks about here. It's called the fools or the foolish. Okay? These are the opposite of the wise. Now, they are foolish, not because they are silly, not because they are stupid, not because they are uneducated or low IQ. They are foolish because they have disdained, they have rejected God and His gifts, His love, His eternal plan for them. A person who rejects God is a fool, the Bible tells us. So they are not the unfortunate, they are not the marginalized, but they are rather the proud, the arrogant, the conceited, the self-centered ones who say that I'm all right, I can do everything by myself. But then there's a third group of person that we often forgot. Okay? It's called, we call the simple. Who are the simple? You see, the simple are neither the wise nor the foolish. They are truly the spiritually unlearned and the ignorant. The term simple, in fact, in the original language in Hebrew, okay, basically means one who is open-minded, one who is open. In other words, the simple are, are people who have yet to make a decision in their life, yet to make a commitment in their life. They are making a commitment. In fact, their minds need to be open. It's like an unfurnished room waiting to be furnished with beautiful furnitures. They are easily influenced. They are impressionable. Perhaps some of us sitting here, we may call ourselves the simple in that sense. We are still seeking after God. We are going from simple to becoming wise. But don't ever be a fool. Don't ever be somebody who rejects God. And you know something? That's what the Bible says here. The, book, the, the Proverbs is really for the simple. God says these are the group of people that the Proverbs will be helpful. Okay? So if you really want to become wise from being simple, there are really 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. Okay? And if you were to just take one chapter a day and read, I bet you, at the end of one month, you'll be wiser. Okay? Next, the Bible tells us the Proverbs are also for the young. The young refer to the youth. The youth are also like the simple in the sense that the youth have not formed their convictions yet. Okay, so they are again also empty, also open. Okay? So friends, I think today is important for us to give this impression to our young. Still people are coming to the Lord when they are young, and we need to help the young. And Proverbs says it is especially for the simple and for the young. And then verse 5 tells us that even the wise can continue to learn from it. 
So much so that verse 6 says that He can continue to help us learn more and more uh, from even uh, and wiser and wiser Proverbs. So in other words, the truly wise will become wiser. The truly foolish will become only more foolish as they repel God. And I love what this author says. Okay? <coughs> uh, Raymond Ortland basically says this. He says, The book of Proverbs is practical help from God for weak people like us stumbling through daily life. It is His counsel for the perplexed, His strength for the defeated, His warning to the proud, His mercy for the broken. The book of Proverbs is really the gospel, the good news for the inept, through the wisdom of another. Okay? We have every reason to receive it with a whole heart. And with this, we come to the last part, which is really the wisdom of Proverbs. You see, the verse 7 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Okay? This will be repeated actually two times more in this Proverbs, okay? In chapter 9 and chapter 15, and we'll come to that later on. But it tells us one important thing, that true knowledge starts from fearing God. And this fear leads to a right relationship with God. It comes from turning away from sins and turning to God. So true knowledge is really wisdom. Okay? Now, I want to tell you know that this is really the theme and the motto of this entire book altogether. Okay? And it tells us that the fear of the Lord is associated with wisdom. And in fact, this is not only just found in Proverbs, it's found throughout the Old Testament. Job talked about this, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Psalms talk about this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And just now I mentioned those two other verses in Proverbs, they also talk about the fear of the Lord and wisdom. Even in the prophets, Micah talked about the fear of your name being wisdom. What can we learn here? There are just two things I want to close for us to learn. How do we fear the Lord and how do we acquire wisdom? Now, what does it mean to fear the Lord? You see, the word fear is the word ira in the Bible. Okay? Ira occurs 40 time, 14 times in the book of Proverbs. And each time the word fear is used, it's used in conjunction with the Lord. Okay? Ired Adonai. Okay? You are supposed to fear the Lord. The word means fear or terror. Okay? And we but when it's referring to God, the word means an inspired reverence, okay? An inspired reverence, an astonishment, an awe, a sense of awe. So to fear the Lord is really that reverential root, awe rooted in the greatness and the vastness of God. It is an adoration. The fear of the Lord is worship altogether, okay? The fear of the Lord really is not, therefore, a cringing dread before the Lord. I'm just so scared of the Lord. It is not a guilt feeling that, oh God, here comes God, I did something wrong, and I'm now for it. No, it's not that. But what is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord basically is this. It's putting God as all important. It is being mindful and seeking God's presence and pleasure. The fear of the Lord is minding what God thinks, not what others think. I think this is particularly important for all of us. Many of us today, we live because we fear what other people will think of us. But the fear of the Lord says, I'm more mindful about what God thinks. The fear of God is deferring to God. God, you have your way. I don't understand. I will still defer to you. I trust you. I cannot understand why this calamity falls me, but I will still trust you. That's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is worship. The fear of the Lord is really obeying the Lord. You know, every new fear of the Lord <clears throat> is a transformational milestone in our lives. It makes us know God more. Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It makes us grow wiser. Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. Every new fear that the Lord put in your heart is His transformation work in your life to make you know Him more, to make you wiser. Let me just share with you this. I went to Sunday school 
even before I knew how to walk. I heard about Jesus Christ even before I heard about ABC. And I'm not lying because I'm really a Hokkien being. Eh? <laughs> you cut me inside and cut my thoughts inside, it's all Hokkien. Okay? And I never learned about ABC first, but I learned about Jesus Christ first. I gave to my life to Christ when I was in primary six. But prior to that, I you know expletive, vulgarity sometimes would just come out of my mouth. And that's because of the environment I grew up in. Everybody was speaking those like normal language. And then one day, on the bus on the way home from school, something happened. I was in deep thoughts all by myself. And you know, when you are thinking, you are saying things to yourself. And expletive come in my thoughts. And friends, you, you may laugh at me, but those are my lingua franca, that sound. <laughs> I have to use those to think. If not, I cannot think. But out of the blue, the Holy Spirit came upon me and prompted me. And he asked me, Yao Bing, what did you just say in your mind? Do you know what they mean? Now, for the first time in my life, I became a linguist. And I started evaluating the very words that I was saying. And, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's words. Okay. They were part of my vo daily vocabulary. I kind of knew that they were vulgarities before all along, but I never bothered to investigate. But when the Holy Spirit came upon me and asked me that question, I stopped and I thought, I didn't know something. The fear of the Lord that overcame me. I felt so ashamed of myself. In my heart, I thought to myself, Yao Bing, how dare you let these filthy words come out of my mouth? The fear of the Lord came over me. It was not a fear that lightning would strike me because I said those words. But the fear of the Lord came over me in the form of a deep, deep respect and reverence for God. It was a great, great disappointment that I felt that I have let God down so much. I cried before the Lord. I said, God, I'm sorry that I would even speak such words. I did not even need to decide there and then that from then on, I would not speak the word. I just stopped like that. No decision even need to be made. I just stopped. Okay. Friends, that is the fear of the Lord. And my love, respect and fear of God just made me stop. So you see, the fear of the Lord will bring you to a place of maturity, whereby you don't even need a book of lists, a book of do or don'ts. You need to do this or not. No. But you know that you can follow the Lord because He's doing it for you. The other thing really we want to talk about is really wisdom, and we want to end here. What is wisdom? Really, the Bible talks a lot about wisdom. Wisdom is really knowing the right and doing the right and living the right. That's what James tells us. He says, who is wise and understanding among him? Let him show it by their good life, by the deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Okay? And this is the wisdom that is from heaven above. Okay? So what is wisdom? Wisdom is really a spiritual relationship with God, a knowledge of God and His will. Wisdom is not found in a mocker, the Bible tells us. The fool, remember, we talk about him, he has no wisdom. And wisdom, let me just tell you, is humility. It walks together. Humility and wisdom walk together like two legs. Okay? The Bible says in Proverbs 11, 2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Show me a humble man, and chances are he is also a wise man. Show me an arrogant man, and chances are he may be clever, he may be cunning, but he is never wise. Okay? Be wise. Okay? Be wise. You know, the word wisdom really comes 111 times just in the book of Proverbs itself. The whole Bible, the whole book of Proverbs really is about wisdom. Okay? You look, you know, here, it talks about the topics, you know, it is about the person of wisdom, the principle of wisdom, the practice of wisdom. Okay? This is what Proverbs chapter 3 tells us, and let me just end by reading it out to you. Okay? It says, Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and use better returns than gold. 
She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honour. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. Let's pray. Father God, help us, Lord, to fear your name and acquire wisdom. Help us, Lord, to understand that you are wisdom. Help us, Lord, to know that you want us to live by wisdom and be blessed as we live wisely for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we rise? standing and receive the Lord's benediction. But even before that happens, just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your hearts and ask yourself this question. What is one thing, God, you want me to apply today as I leave this place? What is the word you are speaking into my heart today?
Allow me to use Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13 to 18 as a benediction for all of us. My son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion. They will be life for you, an ornament to graze your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the ruin that overtakes the wicked. For the Lord will be at your side and will keep your foot from being snared. Now, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. All God's people, let's say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please take a seat and let's watch this video. I hope that would 
set some excitement in your heart as this year we celebrate our 60th anniversary. And what a journey this God has been so faithful and God, good to all of us from a very small at the house heart to what He has given us today. He has blessed us. He has blessed us so that we in turn can be a blessing to the people outside the church. So this is from the 15th of May for the next and uh, continue for the next eight Sundays we will come together to just take a, mem a walk down memory lane to see how God started the church in the early 60s and then we continue to celebrate God's faithfulness and goodness to us to where He has brought us today. And then we're going to dedicate three Sundays for the next gen ministries for them to be able to share their hopes of what Bartley will be for the next 60 years. So I just want to encourage all of you to prepare your hearts to join us in this series of eight Sundays of celebration. I've already heard uh, ex Bartley members who have migrated are planning to come back to just celebrate together with us. So just uh, prepare your hearts if you know of many others who have uh, gone on to join other church. We just ask them to come back and uh, uh, just, just join in the celebration of God's goodness and faithfulness to us any or in every of those eight Sundays. But all this will culminate on the 3rd of July. 3rd of July Sunday, we will have only one service at 10 a.m., and all the other seven congregations, the other six congregations will come and celebrate together and we'll make sure that this whole auditorium is packed. All right? So look forward to it. More information will just be rolled out to you uh, more and more. Uh, I just want to also uh, say a big thank you to all of you who have contributed to the Ukrainian refugee uh, fund. I was, I was overseas and I when I saw the amount that was collected, this really is the heart of Bartley. When we hear of people, they may not be our neighbours, but people who are suffering, I think the touch of God into your hearts have really released the funds that is made available. So now that 70 plus thousand will be uh, handed over to OM, and OM with the six neighbouring countries surrounding Ukraine will be ministering in re refugee centres in providing essential needs uh, for those refugees escaping from Ukraine. But we will not take any more. So we want to thank you for all that you have given. Uh, for those who had not the chance, never mind, there may be another opportunity in the future. And then starting from next Sunday, because of the government has reopened, we will not uh, need you to uh, register online to come, all right? We can take up to 500, and this time, we welcome our brothers and sisters who have not taken their vaccination, who have for some reason chose not to be vaccinated. You are now allowed to come back to worship together with us, but we have to cap the limit up to maximum of 500, and we'll watch it very carefully. All right, but yet, please let brothers and sisters who have not been, who, have, who are not fully vaccinated, know that now they can come back to worship with us in the first or second service. All right, and uh, but the parents with children in KJ, we still need uh, the parents to register online for your children because of the numbers limited to each of the classrooms. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this is all I have for uh, verbal. Just sit back and uh, watch the uh, announcements uh, on video clip.
service is over, but those of you who like the pastors or elders to pray for you, with you, you can just quietly come to the front. Thank you. Have a blessed week.